You may be seated. Well, we designated October as, uh, as Vision Month here at Central, taking Sundays to share our vision for this body of believers. I'm reminded of how the Lord once spoke to the prophet Habakkuk and told him, write the vision and make it plain so that the one who reads may run with it. And it makes sense. It's great for, first and foremost, for the body, for the kingdom, but even for a business. Make it plain so people can understand it and run with it. Too often the time we make it confusion and people sit, it, sit on it, right? But, but in this case, it's pretty clear. Proverbs teaches us that if we do not have vision, we perish, we cast off restraint. We, we don't have a focus. We don't have a purpose. And all of us in this local body need to understand that we're part of something together. All last, uh, oh, excuse me, all this month, I, I decided I wanted to share plainly our vision, as plain as I know how, as a local church and how we walk out our mission together. And I began doing so by defining four action words that describe how we walk out our mission together. It's the core of our mission. And those four words are engage, encourage, equip, and empower. Two weeks ago, I started talking about engaging, specifically engaging the culture around us. We can't ignore the culture. We can't crawl within the four walls of the church looking for relief from the culture. No, it's our mission to engage the culture told you the story of, the, of Jesus and the woman at the well and, and how important it is that we be a people who are engaged with the culture, that we build friendships, we practice hospitality, we, we open our lives, and in many cases our homes, and begin to engage people. Last week I talked about the fact that we need to be a house that resonates with encouragement, uh, encouraging one another in the faith. People need encouragement Amen. in a big way. And we need to live and maintain a church culture, frankly, that just drips from the rafters. I don't any, know any other way to say it. It needs to surround what we do. We need a prophetic sense of encouragement for people to run the race that God has called them to. And today I want to talk about the third of our four actions, and that is equip. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. And Paul begins... The fourth chapter of Ephesians, like this. I therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now let me pause, because he uses a word there, the second word in that passage, therefore. And we all have heard this, right? When you see a therefore, you have to ask what it is. Very good, guys, therefore. And in this particular case... It's the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. When you think about, okay, what has Paul already told these believers? He's been sharing with them about their amazing relationship with Jesus Christ. He has told them, beginning in the first chapter, that the Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, and that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Amen. He describes for us the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and the greatness, the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. And then in chapter 2, he reminds them, once you were dead in trespasses and sin, but God, who is rich in mercy, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive in Jesus Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he raised us up in him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order that, get this, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one could boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, so we're called to a purpose. In chapter 3, he went on to say that he bowed his knees to God, asking that our spirits would be strengthened so that we could even begin to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. Man, that'll blow you away. He's basically saying, I'm praying that you guys, you can't grasp it, 
You're, you do not have the intellectual capacity to grasp it. None of us do. It's beyond knowledge. If, it's, if he says it's beyond knowledge, it's beyond knowledge, friends. Amen. That he loves us so much that we really need like a spiritual revelation to get it. Amen. Now that should be encouraging to us all. We need a supernatural eye opening so we can understand just how much he loves us. And then after he said all of these things, those first three chapters, he turns around to those Ephesian believers and he says, I therefore urge you to walk in a manner that is worthy of this calling that you've received. Yeah. Considering how awesome our relationship and how good the news is, Paul begins this chapter and he says, therefore, walk worthy of the Lord. Now, I may not be the most clever guy in the room, but I will say this. It strikes me that if I can walk worthy, I can walk unworthy. We can miss the level. We can miss the opportunity that he's offered to us. And so he goes on and he says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. That's why it says when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. He's beginning to speak here of spiritual gifts. Uh, They're described in multiple places in the scripture. The most famous are probably in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, in which all kinds of different gifts are described. And then here in Ephesians 4, if we drop down to verse 11, he's going to mention five specific gifts. He says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by that which every joint supplies, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so it builds itself up in love. Now, here is this passage where he talks about giving apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Sometimes it's referred to as the five-fold ministry. More commonly, they're referred to as the ministry gifts. There's sometimes, and this isn't, this isn't Bible, this is theology. That certain gifts like the gift of giving or the gift of serving are often sometimes referred to as motivational gifts because they're motivational forces in our lives. And then there's gifts like prophecy and miraculous gifts of healing and things like that that are sometimes referred to as manifestation gifts because it's a manifestation of the power of God. Really, it's not about us. And then there are these gifts he describes here in Ephesians that he refers to as ministry gifts. Now, every one of those are unique. An apostle is not the same as a teacher. And a teacher is certainly not the same thing as a prophet. And a prophet's not an evangelist. They're all different. They all have different bents to their ministry gifts. And yet, they do have a couple of things in common, all of them. One thing that they all have in common is this. They speak. They declare the word. They preach. Uh, A silent prophet's not very useful teacher who doesn't open his mouth isn't much of a teacher, right? So all of them have in common that they speak, but the other thing that all of them have in common is that the purpose of their teaching and speaking and sharing is one singular purpose, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's what it's about. Who are the saints? You are. We are right? So if there's any purpose for church leadership, it is this, to equip the saints. 
to equip them to walk as ministers of the gospel in the earth. And whatever your job, whatever your vocation, whatever you do for a living, let me assure you, you are a minister of the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what you've been called to. That's what you've been given. We are the carriers of this incredible good news to everyone around us in the culture. We're called to be influencers. We're called to make the world better by our presence. We are the salt and the light. And so if there's any reason that I am here today, it's to serve you by equipping. That's the job. If there's any purpose to have a local church meet, it is this, to equip the people of God for their calling. The Greek expression here, katartismos, is derived from the Greek word katartizo, which means to completely furnish, to thoroughly prepare or and some means thoroughly restore. I like that. The King James Version uses perfecting of the saints to completely restore. You might say it this way. Um, All of us came to Christ as fixer-uppers. We're all messed up. Unless a revelation for some. Um, But there was an original design that God created us for. And this world has a way of eh, ripping apart that, you know, our fallen nature and the nature of this world. But but God is restoring us to an image that he envisions. Mature, complete, capable, healed, restored, ready for action, effective in this life for the sake of his kingdom. And to accomplish that equipping, God gives us relationships. Yes, as I mentioned, he gives us relationships with ministry gifts, pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets and apostles. But I want you to notice this. He also puts us in relationship with one another. Look at this at Ephesians 4, continuing that passage. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things unto him who is the head, Christ, from which the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which each part does its share, causes growth in the body. Okay, so he just told us that the joints supply something critical to our maturing and equipping. Now, I'm no medical person, but here's what I know. A joint is not a part. A joint is where two parts come together. Okay? We good with that? All the medical people agree. I got a forearm, I got a hand. This thing in between where they meet is called a wrist. The thing about that wrist is, is these pieces come together and they're held together, but but they rub. And because they rub like this, I'm able to do things. I mean, I can play the guitar. I can do things, right? I have ability. You're the same way, whether it's your knees. Wherever Wherever you have joints, two parts come together and enable effectiveness. A joint is not an individual part. It's where two parts come together. And the rub of that relationship actually helps us become mature as we cling to relationship in the midst of the friction. I hope you just got that analogy that Paul laid on us, because it's important. According to the Apostle Paul, God wants us to be matured and transformed into a whole, restored, secure, ready-for-action follower of Jesus. And to accomplish that, he gives us a community called the church, in which there are two things that mature us. Ministry gifts that share the word and relationships that both encourage us and sometimes cause friction. Maybe the church is exactly what it's supposed to be. No, we should should never have friction. Really. It wouldn't be the church. Because as we cling to each other in relationship. Understanding that we are surrendered to a king, there's something that happens. We grow. We mature in new ways. And we have power and effectiveness together that none of us can individually do. Lone Ranger Christianity is killing the American church. There, I said it. It wasn't in the notes. Equipping means change, it means growing up, it means learning. We live in a world where there is great deception abounding. There are lies, and if we don't want to be carried around by every wind, we better equip. 
And as a church, we have to be a house that equips the saints for the work of the ministry. Can I show you just a couple of other passages where that word katartizo is used? Because the English translations don't always get it. And I noticed this the other day, and I thought it was fascinating. And, and this is that when he says the equipping of the saints, that katartizo. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, here's how it reads in English. Now I plead with you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. What you see there as three words, perfectly joined together, is katartizo. He's saying, I want you to be equipped so you're running at the speed of unity. In 2 Corinthians 13, 11, he says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete, be of good comfort, One mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Once again, that word complete, katartizo. He's speaking of being equipped. And the definition of that is these relationships that bring both instruction and occasional rub that bring us into a place where we have hearts that beat for Jesus and the kingdom and nothing else. There's another word that we sometimes use for all of us humans who are living out this equipping process, and that word is this, disciple. Equipping is synonymous with discipleship. Equipping means being a disciple of Jesus. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do everything that I have commanded, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This great commission that we so often quote around here, Jesus is giving us a command to make disciples. We are never commanded to make converts. We're commanded to make disciples. And there's a difference between a disciple and a convert. Anybody can switch their religion and decide which place they want to attend. For example, you can decide, I'm going to be a good person and start going to church. And you can self-identify as a Christian. In fact, nowadays you can self-identify as anything. But I digress. Uh, But you can self-identify as a Christian. And that makes you a convert, but it's a different thing really to be his, isn't it? To be his disciple, to learn from him, to want to obey him and follow his ways. Joining a church is easy, But being a disciple requires a little bit of effort, doesn't it? The word disciple appears more than 500 times just in the four Gospels. That's a lot. The word convert, it's not even in the Bible. Now wait, some of you are going, wait, I've seen that word. Uh, Let me me show you. Because there's four places in some of our English versions, specifically the NIV, that uses it. The NIV English, you see the word convert uh, on two occasions in English in Matthew 23, 15 and Acts 6, 5. But the actual Greek word there is a word for proselyte, which is a Greek convert to to Judaism. Someone who converted from from pagan Greek god worship to, to Judaism. It wasn't uncommon. The two other times... One is in Romans, which speaks of Eponidas. He's referred to as the first convert. But literally, some of your versions get it right. It says the first fruits of Christ. And the other time in 1 Timothy, when it speaks of leaders, it said he shouldn't be a recent convert. In the Greek, it literally means he shouldn't be a novice. Said all that to just say this. The word convert does not even appear in the New Testament. Now, It's very important that we make a decision to follow Jesus. And praying a prayer of repentance and asking Jesus into your heart, that is where life begins. But as a disciple, that's a lifestyle. And many times, it's kind of a gradual process. How many of you have learned that you're different now? You've walked with the Lord for years, but you're different now than you were five years ago. What is a disciple really? A disciple is a learner under discipline. In the Greek New Testament, the word disciple that I mentioned there so often is a Greek word called mathetes. It's where we get our word mathematics, and it literally means understanding produced by effort. And I like to say that just as it's kind of, you know, it takes effort to get math, 
It takes effort to be a disciple. We submit our minds and our lives and our way of thinking to the Lord and under his discipline. A disciple has to be a learner, a lifelong learner. Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. If someone's not always learning, they're not a disciple. And y'all are quiet. How many of you had God speak something to you this week? You were reading the Bible, all of a sudden you noticed something and it just kind of left off the page. You went, yeah, wow. You learned something new, didn't you? You're constantly learning. The day you stop learning and growing in the things of God, in a real sense, we're not moving forward. We're moving backwards, right? So a disciple is a learner. A disciple is also someone who's under discipline because Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Now, a yoke determines the direction of the ox. The ox just doesn't just do anything he wants to, however he wants to, go anywhere he wants to. Because there's things in God's word that God's told us. And we, we may say, you know, I'd like to do this, but mm, God's word says, I don't do that. Jesus has said not to do that. Instead, I should go in this direction. And because we have his yoke, which is actually easy and light, we go, no, Lord, you get to decide my value system. You get to decide those kinds of things. It is because we're in love with him. It's not we're following the rules. No, that's not it. It's that we have become his disciples. And we let his yoke rest upon us. And we learn of him. And we give up the right to decide everything for ourselves because we let him decide. So let me be clear what I mean by discipleship. I'm not talking about becoming a disciple of John Hamilton. Now, by the way, if you become exactly like me, I may think you are a marvelous person. (laughs) But the truth is this. God has a design and a mission for you. And you're supposed to be the person that Jesus envisions for you to be. And my job is simply to help you be a disciple of Jesus, to be his disciple. A disciple of Jesus learns from him, surrenders to him, and obeys him. As Jesus once said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? Because in a real sense, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He is our king. A disciple of Jesus is more than just someone who believes it's more than just having a set of, of, of values or a worldview. It's one thing to become a believer. It's actually a step to become a disciple. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? In Luke, he said, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It costs you nothing to just assent intellectually to a set of values, but it will cost you everything to be a disciple. Not that you earn anything, not that you're earning it, but in this sense, you give your all to Jesus. As I quoted a little while ago, we become living sacrifices. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this way, Christianity without discipleship is Christianity without Christ. There have always been people who would trust God for salvation, but would not follow Jesus or his ways. We're not just called to be believers. We're called to be disciples. Not just be good people. We're called to be carriers of the kingdom of heaven. We are called to invade earth with the culture and the values. I I like to say it, we make colonies of heaven here on earth. We're outposts that are full of the culture and the values and the ways that are not of this world. We're called to demonstrate who the real king is. And to do that, we have to be equipped. Because we've got to, as I said, engage culture. And we've got to encourage people in the faith with a church that is a culture of encouragement. And we need to equip people to walk out of these doors and be agents of change and carriers of God's glory. And to do that, we have to be equipped. Equipping the saints is the call of the church. So what does this mean for us here at Central? First and foremost, I believe we need to be a church that makes disciples who know how to make disciples. A church where everybody works together for a clear goal. Making believers, disciples who know God, who are strong, who build the kingdom, and are ready to help make another disciple. That is simply a kingdom principle. 
We need people who are equipped to understand God's Word, not in a superficial way, but they really know God's Word for themselves. We need to equip people to understand the work of the cross. How many people go through their lives and don't really get the freedom that Jesus bought for us at Calvary? They struggle with strongholds, or struggle with issues if they understood what Jesus really did for them. They would be free. We need to equip people to know the deliverance and healing of Christ. We need to equip people to have a worldview that's illuminated by the truth of Scripture. We must be a church that has a clear path of discipleship that anybody can walk. From the moment they surrender their lives to Christ, that they're surrounded with support, they're surrounded with equipping. We, we actually began the process of ramping up our equipping last year when we changed Wednesday nights and began offering, as I shared earlier, multiple adult tracks of discipleship and electives. But really, that's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Uh, next for us, I believe we need to have an ongoing foundations class for new believers. We need to have leadership development classes and, and even more. Because beyond the basics, not everybody needs the exact same equipping. All of us need a foundation in the Word of God, but we don't all need the exact same equipping at the exact same time, do we? Parents need a particular type of equipping. They do. We must be equipping parents to raise counter-cultural children. Marriages need equipping. All of us need to be equipped and learn wise financial strategies. We need to learn biblical principles in those kind of areas of our lives, don't we? We need all kinds of Christians. Christians need to be equipped with vision to step into every segment of culture and be prepared to be influencers and leaders. I've been saying this for over a year. And one of the reasons why we started an entrepreneurship class and things like that was because I believe God wants to raise up people who will impact because, because they're carriers of the Lord Jesus, because they have a relationship with the living God who illuminates their hearts and their minds and gives them ability they didn't have before, that God will raise them up as leaders. The church, long, too long, church world in general, withdrew to the four walls of the church, thinking we have our spiritual life and we have our secular life. No, we have life in Jesus and it impacts everything we do Amen. and everywhere we go. From the time people make a decision to walk with God, to getting healing and freedom, to learning God's word, to becoming a leader, uh, as a church, we need to have that clear ability within this house to make disciples because we are called to equip. And because we need healing and deliverance as part of that, beginning early in 2023, we are going to begin having encounter weekends. Now, some of you have been a part of of uh, encounter retreats that have happened in years past at Central. How many of you have been a part of one? Let me see your hands. Okay. You have an idea in your head of what this is going to be, but I want to promise you something. It's going to be better than you think. We have, uh, the Lord's been speaking, and we want, to, we want people to be able to experience freedom and the power of God. That is part of equipping. I see a church in my heart that prepares men and women to be end-time warriors to be church planners, to be missionaries, to be leaders in culture, in business, and in every endeavor of humanity. I see a church where people build their lives on the foundation of God's word and where people can stand in the face of culture and speak wisdom and God's word into every situation. I see a church where the most ignorant, clueless person whose lifestyle would be offensive to most people in this room. I see a church where someone like that walks in and they can be welcomed and loved and transformed into an apostolic warrior for Jesus Christ. We've talked a little bit, Tammy and I have, about the importance of equipping our children in the next generation. Well, as a church, we are setting and reaching for far greater emphasis on equipping our children. It's why we've taken the time to talk about that last month. Because I'll just say it this way, until Jesus returns, we need a long-term strategy in place that believes equipping begins with our youngest. The culture in the world that they are facing requires them to be rooted powerfully in the knowledge of God. 
They need to be rooted powerfully in his word. And they need to have experienced God. I see a church that disciples children into strong, lifelong, powerful adult Christians. And that's why we're getting ready to enter phase two of Foundations for the Future. We're just about done with some of the renovations we wanted to do here to our worship area and to the lobby. But phase two is all about a complete renovation of a new children's area here at Central. With your help, we're going to begin transforming the upstairs north end of this building into a new children's worship center. We want to make it a beautiful, exciting, and very inviting experience. I'm going to tell you today for a reason, because I'm going to tell you that um, in just a few weeks, on November 13th, we want to take up a special offering and want to receive pledges as we have before to fund this project. So November 13th, put this on your calendar, miracle offering. We're going to believe God to provide the resources to do the things that we need to be able to do. So pray about what you might be able to play a part in that. Um, The truth is, we we really want to build a, a beautiful and amazing experience for our children from the moment they enter in, and we want to add to that continued teaching in God's word, the impartation of a vision for God to use them in great ways, and a support system for their parents. All of that. That's got to be the mission ahead, guys, because we're raising kids in a completely different generation and a completely different culture than the one you and I were raised in. We got to up our game. We got to up our game. I want them to grow up in this church and go from powerful children to powerful youth and be so strong that when this culture encounters them, they go, wow. As a church, we have a call to be equipping for a purpose, to send. Some of those ones we're called to equip are the ones that God God is going to use to become worship leaders, to plant churches, and to become missionaries who will go into the unreached areas of the earth. If there's one thing that I absolutely know that the Lord spoke to me about our mission is that we are called to be a house that sends people from the four walls out into the world. And in order to do that, if we're going to send, we have to equip. And so I would like to announce today that along those lines, we have signed a letter of intent with Southeastern University to begin to establish, beginning in the fall of 2023, an extension campus of Southeastern University here at Central Assembly. We will not only train men and women for the work of the ministry, they're going to be able to get accredited college uh, hours for it and be eligible for ministry credentials as a result of that for the mission field, for church planning. Ultimately, our vision is to be able to raise up men and women who can serve here as they're being trained. And in the meantime, they're being provided with every area of equipping as church planners and missionaries right from this campus. Amen? It may start with a few. It may start with one or two. It may start with you or me. (laughs) But you know what? By God's help, we're going to be doing it this time next year. This time next year. I see a church full of disciple makers who are world changers because they have learned to sit at Jesus' feet. One of my favorite passages of scripture is from Acts chapter 4, where it says this, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, Why I love this passage is a little funny. When it says there that they were unschooled, ordinary men, the Greek word there is the Greek word idiotes. Does that sound like something? You betcha. Basically, what it's saying is when they saw that these guys were ordinary idiots who were doing this stuff, they were amazed and they took note that they had been with Jesus. Would you stand with me? Christ has many acquaintances, but fewer disciples. Many who know about him, fewer who know him. Jesus has many admirers, fewer followers. 
There are a lot of people who want to have Jesus in their life, but very few who want to give up their lives for Jesus Christ. There are masses who claim to lay at the feet of the master, but how many give him a place to lay his head, his authority, his kingship, his lordship? It's not about what we think or believe. That's not enough. It's about loving him and being transformed into the image of the one we love. I pray that God would raise up a generation of people in this house who would care for nothing except Jesus. Men and women who would leave all for the cause of Christ. Men and women who would shake the foundations of this world and of this culture. You guys in agreement? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, to this mission we commit ourselves, Lord. Lord, raise up an equipping house. Teach us how to teach. Teach us how to shepherd. Teach us how to lead, Lord. Lord, send to us and we will send them out to the ends of the earth, Lord Jesus. And Lord, for everyone here, Lord, cause us to have a keen awareness. A keen awareness of you and your adequacy in our lives. That we wouldn't miss an opportunity. We would walk worthy of this amazing calling you've given us. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to be whom be glory forever. Amen. I want to remind you who you are and that the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you and dwells in you.